Karbag, central Turkey. This is the site of the ancient village of Ipsus. Hi, I'm Adam Arand. In 301 BC, a great battle would take place here at Ipsus between four men claiming succession over Alexander's Macedonian Empire. The empire has been split between Alexander's many generals, and the fourth and final war of the Diadochi has reached its climax. For roughly the last 20 years or so, Alexander's former empire has been stricken with constant infighting and struggle that would end Alexander's dynasty and permanently divide his once great empire. Now, prepare to witness the various battles and conflicts that took place during the four wars of the Diadochi as Alexander's generals battled to claim succession over his empire. To the vast numbers of soldiers, their formations, and the context and history of the engagements. Now, on Decisive Eras. To fully see how Alexander's great empire was plunged into chaos, we must go back to around 30 years before Ipsus. On October 1st, 331 BCE, Alexander the Great led his army of 50,000 men against the king of Persia, Darius III's 150,000 men, chariots, and elephants on the dusty plain of Galgamela. Despite the numerical disadvantage, Alexander would win a stunning victory smashing the Persian forces and causing Darius to flee. Alexander would pursue Darius to Bactria, where he'd find the King of Kings dead, killed by his own generals. The Achaemenid Persian Empire was no more, and Alexander would conquer the remaining satraps before going south to India, where he won his last great victory at Hadaspes in 326 BCE. However, his soldiers would go no further, forcing Alexander to return to Babylon where he would never leave. In 323 BCE, Alexander the Great, who had conquered the Great Persian Empire, died at age 32, only 12 years after becoming the King of Macedonia. In June 323 BC, Alexander the Great became extremely ill, and less than two weeks later, he would die at age 32 in Babylon. When his generals had asked him who should succeed him, Alexander had replied, the strongest. Alexander had formed the greatest empire in the world at the time. However, he had no official heir, and so it didn't take long for conflict to begin. While Alexander's wife, Roxana, was pregnant, there was no guarantee it would be a son. A conflict between whether Alexander's brother, Aridaeus, should become king or not emerged, and the great general Perdiccas would come out on top after having General Meleager killed. Perdiccas would become regent of the Macedonian Empire, and would divide the empire between the various generals who had supported him. Roxana would later give birth to a son, Alexander IV, who technically became the official king of the empire. Meanwhile, revolts in Greece and Bactria were quickly put down, and Perdiccas went to Cappadocia to aid the governor, Eumenes, against the remaining Persian resistance there. Perdiccas now found an opportunity to gain a place in the royal line of succession after discovering Alexander's sister Cleopatra desired to marry him. While he was already married to the daughter of another governor, Antipater, Perdiccas wrote letters to Cleopatra promising to marry her. These letters were intercepted, however, by the general Antigonus. Antigonus would inform Antipater, and the two men, along with the renowned general Craterus, would prepare their armies to cross over to Asia Minor and attack Perdiccas. The growing coalition would also gain the support of another general, Ptolemy, who controlled Egypt. Perdiccas was still completely unaware of the impending war on him and was focused on sending Alexander's body back to Macedonia. Ptolemy, however, would seize this opportunity to strike and stole Alexander's body, taking it to Egypt. Only a year after Alexander's death, the first war of the Diadochi would begin after Ptolemy stole Alexander's body and took it to Egypt. Perdiccas would lead an army south to invade Egypt and sent Eumenes to Anatolia to deal with Antigonus and Antipater. In 321 BCE, Perdiccas reached the Nile Delta, 
but was prevented from crossing by Ptolemy's army. Perdiccas would attempt to quickly cross and assaulted an ill-defended fort. However, Ptolemy's army arrived to support the fort and pushed Perdiccas back. He now marched further south and attempted to cross at another point. The river crossing was deeper, however, and many men drowned as they tried to retreat back to the shore. Perdiccas' army now demanded blood, and so his generals would kill Perdiccas. One of these generals was a man named Seleucus. In Asia Minor, Antipater's forces had crossed into Phrygia. Many local governors and generals refused to serve under Eumenes, and another general, Neoptolemus, betrayed Eumenes, and after a small clash, retreated to join Antipater. Believing Eumenes was doomed, Antipater sent half his army under the revered general Craterus and Neoptolemus to finish him off. The two armies would meet in battle near the Hellespont, and Craterus believed the Macedonian soldiers under Eumenes would defect to him once they saw him. Eumenes was aware of the renown of Craterus, and had only foreign troops line up against him. No Macedonians were included on the left wing, and the army was told that they were fighting the traitor Neoptolemus. The infantry would never see battle, as Craterus would die fighting the foreign troops, and the rest of his army completely routed after his death. Despite this stunning victory, the forces of Antipater had already won the war with the death of Perdiccas and quickly seized Susa and Babylon, repartitioning the empire. Antipater would become the new regent, and the royal family was sent back to Macedonia. Lastly, Antigonus would be given a large army and sent back to Asia Minor to finish off the remaining pro-Perdiccas forces, and Antigonus would meet Eumenes in battle at Orkinia in 319 BCE. Antigonus would deceive his enemy by extending his line to double what it would normally be, and making his army look massive. Eumenes' disheartened troops were quickly overrun and crushed. What loyalists remained under Eumenes retreated to the city of Mora, where Antigonus would follow them. Antigonus would offer him peace, but awaited orders from Antipater for his approval. Antipater, however, would pass away at age 80 while Antigonus was finishing off the remaining resistance in Phrygia. After being informed of Antipater's death, Antigonus generously offered Eumenes peace, as well as his former governorship of Cappadocia and a position as Antigonus' second-in-command. Eumenes would quickly accept. Back in Macedonia, Polyperchon had succeeded Antipater in 318 BCE, but Antipater's son, Cassander, was gathering an army to confront him. Cassander would form an alliance with Antigonus. Looking for allies, Polyperchon sent a messenger to Eumenes with an enticing offer. Although Eumenes had agreed to join Antigonus, Polyperchon made him an offer he couldn't refuse. He granted him title of King's General in Asia, as well as large sums of money and command of the elite Silver Shields. Antigonus was outraged and abruptly halted his plans to invade Macedonia in order to deal with Eumenes, who was quickly heading east in order to enlist the aid of the eastern governor. By the time Antigonus had reached Mesopotamia, Eumenes had gathered a large army. Eumenes' forces would blunt Antigonus' crossing of the Cophrates River, capturing 4,000 men and forcing Antigonus to travel around the Zagros Mountains. However, while Eumenes wanted to head back to Asia Minor, his allies forced him to head back to Persepolis before heading north to confront Antigonus again at Peraktikane. In 317 BC, Eumenes and Antigonus would meet in battle at Peraitikene. Each general would lead around 40,000 men. Both Antigonus and Eumenes would put their most elite troops on their right wings, the position of honor in the Macedonian line. Antigonus's light cavalry on the left wing would drive back Eumenes' elite cavalry before being chased away. The two main phalanx lines would collide, and Eumenes' elite silver shields crushed Antigonus's infantry who began to retreat. Antigonus himself, on his right wing, found an opening in Eumenes' left and routed the left wing of Eumenes' army before falling back. While the battle ended in a stalemate, Eumenes had come off better, losing far less men. Antigonus' army, now weakened, would attempt to catch Eumenes off guard by attacking in the winter of 316 BCE instead of waiting for the summer. His plan was foiled, however, and Eumenes prepared to meet Antigonus in a plain near Gabiene. Antigonus would use the same formation he had previously, 
but Eumenes would place his elite troops on his left in order to face Antigonus' right. Eager for a swift victory, Eumenes charged his cavalry and elephants, which kicked up large dust clouds, allowing Antigonus' light cavalry to sneak off and assault Eumenes' baggage train. While Eumenes' cavalry assault was unsuccessful, his phalanx, led by the silver shield, shattered Antigonus' army, which routed. After the battle, Eumenes was informed that their baggage train had been taken. For the silver shields, this was disastrous, as their entire families and possessions were now withheld by Antigonus. Thinking only for themselves, the silver shields seized Eumenes and brought him before Antigonus. Antigonus pondered what to do with him, and after much consideration, reluctantly had Eumenes executed. The impressive career of Alexander's former secretary turned general came to an end. After the Battle of Gaviane, the Second War of the Diadochi came to a close. Antigonus had won, and now became the most powerful of the successors, gaining control of all the Asian provinces. Antigonus quickly set about consolidating his power. He had many of the traitorous leaders and governors executed and imprisoned. Antigonus also did not trust the Silver Shields after their betrayal of Eumene, and had them subtly disposed of by sending them to fight hostile mountain tribes in the harsh regions of the Empire. Seleucus, who now controlled Babylon, had a dispute with his former ally Antigonus, and fearing for his life, fled to Egypt to inform Ptolemy of Antigonus' actions. Ptolemy would then form a coalition with his fellow governors, Asander, Lysimachus, and Cassander, who had recently taken control of Macedonia after defeating Polyperchon and executing Alexander the Great's mother, Olympias. In 314 BCE, Antigonus decided to strike first, taking over Phoenicia and much of Cyprus, and ordered the construction of a large fleet in order to challenge Ptolemy's naval control of the eastern Mediterranean. In 313 BCE, Ptolemy made a surprise attack, retaking Cyprus and raiding the Anatolian coast before heading back to Egypt. Seleucus would convince Ptolemy to retake Syria and the Levant, and they would meet Demetrius in battle at Gaza in 312 BCE. Despite being outnumbered, Demetrius' forces seemed to initially gain the upper hand. But after his elephants were killed, his army panicked and was completely destroyed. 9,000 of Demetrius' men, nearly half of his army, were killed or captured. Ptolemy would retake his lost territory and sent a smaller army to finish off the remnants of Demetrius' forces. However, Demetrius would successfully ambush the Ptolemaic army at Maius and sent a messenger to his father asking for reinforcements. Antigonus, who had just defeated Asander, rejoined his son and retook all the lost territory before preparing to assault Egypt with his 80,000 men in 311 BCE. But Seleucus had taken control of Babylon and Susa, and Antigonus decided to postpone his invasion of Egypt. He quickly made peace with Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy, and sent his son Demetrius with 20,000 men to retake Babylon. In Greece, Cassander used this opportunity to end any threat to his control of Macedonia, and had Alexander IV and his mother Roxana killed, officially wiping out Alexander the Great's dynasty and making the Macedonian Empire officially defunct. In 310 BCE, Demetrius would retake Babylon, which had been mostly abandoned by Seleucus, before heading back to his father in the west. However, Seleucus would strike back, and Antigonus would lead his army east, sacking Babylon and meeting Seleucus in battle before being defeated by it. From 311 to 309 BC, the Babylonian War would be fought between Antigonus and Seleucus. While little is known about the war, it is clear that Seleucus came out on top as he gained control of all territory east of Babylon. Antigonus had lost control over the east, but quickly turned west as Ptolemy had taken control of the Peloponnese in Greece and coastal Anatolia. He sent his son Demetrius to retake Greece from Ptolemy and Cassander, and would land in Athens in 307 BCE, gaining territory before being ordered by his father to invade the island of Cyprus. In 306 BCE, Demetrius led his 16,000 men and hundreds of ships to assault the city of Salamis. Attempting to gain control of the eastern Mediterranean, Antigonus would send his son Demetrius to Cyprus, where he would lay siege to Salamis in 306 BC. Ptolemy had received word of the attack and brought a large army and fleet to relieve the siege. Ptolemy hoped to combine his armada with the ships trapped in the harbor of Salamis, 
but his plan was disrupted and a large naval battle would ensue at Salamis. Demetrius's fleet would completely overrun Ptolemy's armada, and despite his success on the left flank, Ptolemy would retreat, abandoning the city of Salamis, which would surrender soon after, along with the rest of the island of Cyprus. Ptolemy's power was significantly weakened, and Antigonus now controlled the Mediterranean. With this victory, Antigonus would proclaim himself king, and name his son Demetrius his joint king and successor. The rest of his rivals would make similar proclamations soon after. Seeing this as an opportunity to finish off Ptolemy, Antigonus would lead 90,000 men down the coast till the Nile Delta, with Demetrius shadowing with the fleet. Ptolemy's forces, however, somehow managed to hold out against both land and naval assault, and not wanting to risk a major assault across the river, Antigonus returned to Asia Minor. Antigonus would now send Demetrius to attack the island of Rhodes, which is an ally of Ptolemy. 400 ships and 40,000 men were gathered for the assault, and the huge army would land in 305 BCE. After raiding the coast of Rhodes, Demetrius would prepare to assault the city and its 7,000 defenders. The Rhodians would hold out, however, against repeated naval and land assaults, and despite coming close to taking the city, Demetrius was ultimately unsuccessful. By Antigonus's orders, the year-long siege came to an end, and a peace agreement was made. The Rhodians would construct the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, in celebration of this victory, and Demetrius would be sent back to Greece to deal with Cassander. Cassander had been laying siege to Athens, but Demetrius's arrival would change things. Cassander attempted to retreat north, but was intercepted by Demetrius's forces, resulting in the desertion of 6,000 of Cassander's troops and a humiliating defeat. Demetrius would quickly defeat Cassander and Ptolemy's forces in the Peloponnese, liberating the city-states and gaining their support, as well as marrying a Molossian princess, thus gaining an alliance with the Ephraim League in 303 BCE. Cassander would attempt to make peace with Antigonus, who promptly refused. And so Cassander called for aid from his fellow successors and formed a coalition with Lysimachus and Ptolemy against Antigonus. Seleucus' reply would take far longer, however, as he was campaigning in India against the Mauryan Empire. While the campaign ended in failure, as part of the peace terms, Seleucus would receive 500 Indian war elephants. It was then, in 302 BCE, that Seleucus would receive Cassander's envoy. Accepting the alliance, he began the long march back to Asia Minor. Lysimachus would lead a surprise attack and invade Asia Minor. Antigonus, who was now 80 years old, retook much of his lost territory quickly and cornered Lysimachus. However, it was here that time had ran out for Antigonus. In the winter of 302 BCE, Seleucus would reach Asia Minor in record time, achieving one of the most impressive military marches in history. Seleucus and Lysimachus would unite their armies as Ptolemy began assaulting the Levant. However, he would return to Egypt after hearing a false rumor that Seleucus had been defeated. Antigonus would recall Demetrius from Greece, and they would meet Seleucus and Lysimachus at Ipsus. In 301 BC, Antigonus and Seleucus would meet in battle at Ipsus. This battle would be greater than any other in the wars of the Diadochi. Over 160,000 men would fight to decide who would gain control of the crumbling Macedonian Empire. Antigonus placed Demetrius along with Pyrrhus of Epirus and 5,000 elite cavalry on the right wing, the 70,000 infantry in the center, and himself on the left wing with his remaining 5,000 cavalry. Ahead of his line he placed his elephants and skirmishers. Standing against him were 64,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry along with hundreds of elephants mirroring his deployment. Both sides advanced their elephants and infantry lines, and Demetrius would charge his elite cavalry, overwhelming Seleucus' left-wing cavalry, led by his son, Antiochus. In the center, the phalanxes met, and Antigonus' experienced men began to push back the enemy line. Antigonus had engaged Lysimachus on the left wing, and on the right wing Demetrius had turned back, looking to hit Seleucus' army from behind. However, Seleucus now sprung his trap, and used his remaining elephants to prevent Demetrius from charging. 
He then ordered his light cavalry to flank around through a gap on the right and shatter the Antigonan infantry line. Hoping Demetrius would come and turn the tide of battle, Antigonus would fight to the very end, dying in a shower of enemy javelins. <laughs> The man who had come closest to reuniting Alexander's empire would die in battle at age 81 in 301 BCE, while his son Demetrius would escape to Greece. Thus ended the fourth and final war of the Diadochi, and the victors would divide up Antigonus' territory. Following the death of Antigonus at Ipsus and the collapse of his forces, the coalition led by Seleucus would be victorious. However, the peace would be brief as the former allies would turn on each other, and following the death of Cassander in 298 BC, a civil war over control of Macedonia would erupt. While the wars of the Diadochi had come to a close, the remaining successors and their descendants would continue to fight each other over Greece and the Near East for hundreds of years. It would be over 250 years until the last successor kingdom, Ptolemaic Egypt, would finally fall. It, and all the others, defeated by the growing power of Rome.